reading this morning is Ezekiel 46, the first 18 verses. Thus saith the Lord God, the gateway of the inner court that faces towards the east shall be shut the six working days, but on the Sabbath it shall be opened, and on the day of the new moon it shall be opened. The prince shall enter by way of the vestibule of the gateway from the outside, and stand by the gatepost. The priest shall prepare his bird offerings and his peace offerings. He shall worship at the threshold of the gate. Then he will go out, but the gate shall not be shut behind, until evening. Likewise, the people of the land shall worship at the entrance to this gateway before the Lord on the Sabbath and the new moons. The bird offerings that the prince offers to the Lord on the Sabbath day shall be six lambs without blemish and a ram without blemish and the grains of offering shall be one epah for a ram and the grain offering for a lamb as much as he wants to give as well as a hint of oil with every epah. On the day of the new moon it shall be a young bull without blemish, six lambs and a ram, they shall be without blemish. He shall prepare a grain offering of a beef for a bull and eat that for a ram, and as much as he wants to give for the lambs, and hint of oil for every epad. When the prince enters, he shall go by way of the vestibule of the gateway, and go out the same way. But when the people of the land come before the Lord on their appointed feast days, whoever enters by way of the north gate to worship, shall go out by way of the south gate. And whoever enters by way of the south gate, shall go out by way of the north gate. He shall not return by way of the gate through which he came, but shall go out through the opposite gate. The prince shall then be in their midst when they go in. He shall go in when they go out. He shall go, he will, shall go out. At the festivals and appointed feast days, the grain offering shall be an ephod for a bull, an ephod for a ram, and as much as he wants to give for the lambs and a hint of oil for every epad. Now when the prince makes a voluntary burnt offering or voluntary peace offering to the Lord, the gate that faces towards the east shall be open for him, and he shall prepare his burnt offering and his peace offering as he did on the Sabbath day. Then he shall go out, and after he goes out, the gate shall be shut. You shall daily make a burnt offering to the Lord of the Lamb of the first year without blemish. You shall prepare it every morning. You shall prepare a grain offering with it every morning, a sixth of an ephod, My Bible just... You shall... Yes... You shall prepare a grain offering with it every morning, a sixth of an that, and a hint of, hint of oil to moisten the fine flour. This grain offering is a perpetual ordinance to be made regularly to the Lord. They, sh they shall prepare the lamb, the grain offering, and the oil as a regular burnt offering every morning. Thus saith the Lord God, If the prince leaves the gift of some of his inheritance to any of his sons, it shall belong to his sons. It is their possession by inheritance. But if he gives the gift of some of his inheritance to one of his servants, it shall be his until the day of his liberty, after which he'll return to the prince. But his inheritance shall belong to his sons. It shall become theirs. Moreover, the prince shall not take any of the people's inheritance. By evicting them from property, he shall provide inheritance for his son from his own property, so that none of my people shall be scattered from his property. All right. Does that get the price of the most mysterious Bible reading you've ever had in church? Close. Close? <laughs> you must tell me the one that does then. <laughs> it's in Leviticus. <laughs> Leviticus? Oh, well, there's, there's plenty of mysterious readings in Leviticus, of course. All right, well, it's good to be back with you. And uh, it's good to share fellowship and the singing of the hymns and prayer and uh, meeting around the Lord's table and worshipping the Lord as he wants us to do. And uh, we're grateful to be here. Um, just a quick update. You've probably heard already that my brother had a motorcycle accident a couple of weeks ago. Uh, 
uh, which I unfortunately was a, an eyewitness to um, because I was with him at the time. Uh, he's home, he's got broken ribs down the left hand side of his body and broken left collarbone. Uh, I've had all of those things and I know how painful they are and I know how long they take to heal so he's in for six to eight weeks of breathing very shallowly and praying that no one makes him laugh. Uh, so we're, we're being very, very calm with our conversation when we visit him. But I know that folks have been praying and he is grateful for that and uh, I'll keep you up to date on his progress. Um, I suspect that uh, Saturday the 21st of September was his last day of nearly 50 years of motorcycle riding and uh, I'm re-evaluating my options as well. So we'll see how that happens. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Doc. So we're in the second week, the first week of October. And notionally at least, at the end of this year's preaching on the subject of prophecy. Although to be fair, it comes up a lot, doesn't it? It sort of tends to weave into all of the preaching here, not just myself, but Wayne as well. But for the purpose of the, and Peter, but for the purpose of the exercise this morning, I want to attempt to draw together the various strands of teaching that we've been considering under the general heading of things that underpin the understanding of prophecy. We've covered lots of ground, I'm sure you'll agree. And it's hard to know how to bring these studies to an end. But before we attempt to tie off the many loose ends we've left hanging, so to speak, we need to address one more principle of interpretation because it, in fact, is the key that unlocks our understanding of all Old Testament prophecy and which puts all scripture before Pentecost in its proper perspective. I'm referring to the so-called mystery doctrine taught in the New Testament epistles. So come with me for a few minutes and let's see where it is and what it teaches us about the understanding of huge tracts of the scriptures. <clears throat> now, I know I dealt with this concept at some point uh, fairly recently, I suspect. And if you want to go back and look over the August messages, they're all there on YouTube and they're all on our website if you want to listen to them again uh, while your hands are busy doing something else and your eyes are busy doing something else. There's a couple of choices there. So just the bones then and one reference and consideration of what it means. This is the Apostle Paul in Colossians 1.25. He says, Of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which was hidden from ages and generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So Paul says God did not reveal that Christ would be in believers, most notably the Gentiles, before it actually happened in his time at Pentecost. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 5, in the same doctrine, he says, was revealed then by the Holy Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. Not way back then, but just then. And he's talking about Pentecost. Now we know that the Old Testament prophecies did speak of the Gentiles being joined to God. In Micah chapter 4, verse 2, notably we read, Many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion the Lord shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Well, that's Old Testament. That's Micah, one of the prophets. Paul tells us that that is not the same as what he speaks about in Colossians and in Ephesians 3, 5. Micah is not prophesying the day of Pentecost or the mystery in Ephesians 3, 6, that the Gentiles being fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, that's not the same as what's in Micah chapter 4 and verse 2. Whatever Micah's prophecy is about, it's not about Pentecost and it's not about the church age that followed it. Now, our reading may give you some clue as to what Micah chapter 4 verse 2 in actual fact is about, but we'll come to that. I should add, that if this is the case, if Micah 4.2 is not about Pentecost, then Joel's prophecy in 2.28 about God pouring out his spirit upon all flesh is not about Pentecost either. And for the same reasons. This tells us that we should not be looking for church age prophecies in the Old Testament. That the prophecies there are about the kingdom and Israel and the Gentile nations 
not about Jesus and the church. Further, Paul tells us that the mystery was unlocked in his time, that is, after Pentecost. We must not then be looking for church age prophecy, especially in the preachings of Jesus either. A couple of considerations come out of that, of course. Let's consider them. First of all, Jesus' kingdom, Jesus' teaching are kingdom teaching. Obviously, Jesus' teaching is profitable on so many levels. It's profitable at least on four levels. What are they? Come on, folks. 2 Timothy 3.16. Instruction. <clears throat> Doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. Everything Jesus said is profitable for those four things. He is the Son of God. The teachings of Jesus are a bottomless well of learning on all sorts of levels. But we must be careful in applying them in a careless manner because Jesus was still preaching under the Old Covenant to people who were still under the Old Covenant and only a couple of times did he choose to reveal truths outside of that umbrella. Once when talking to Nicodemus, chapter 3, you must be born again. You won't find that anywhere in the Old Testament. And once in 1416, in the private discourse with the disciples between the upper room and between his arrest, where he spoke about the coming of the Holy Spirit, I am the true vine, I am going away to prepare a place for your coming. None of those things are revealed in the Old Testament. So Jesus is clearly teaching to the Jews about kingdom things. In John 7, 38, he talks about people believing in him. Out of him shall flow rivers of living water. Is clearly a prophecy of the, only, the coming of the Holy Spirit in the day of Pentecost. But it's not systemic teaching on that prophecy, on that subject. For the rest of his teachings, Jesus' teaching are wholly based in the law of Moses and in the Old Testament. Indeed, all the way through his ministry, the controversies in Jesus' ministry are always about his attitude to the law. The Pharisees are constantly picking on him about his attitude to the, to the Sabbath. He heals the lame man by the pool and says, get up and walk. The Pharisees are outraged. You're not allowed to do that. It's the Sabbath day. Jesus said, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. We must be careful, however, not to write off Jesus' teaching as wholly belonging to the old covenant and of no relevance to us because Jesus was the most moral and practical teacher of righteousness who ever walked this earth, and he was preparing the disciples for the coming of the Holy Spirit, as the verse in John 7, 38 tells us. Secondly, <clears throat> working on the same principle of if the word makes sense, seek no other sense, compare with me for just a moment the two teachings on the mechanisms of his second coming, one from Jesus himself and the other later from Paul. Remember, unless the surrounding text dictates another interpretation, except the interpretation is there on its face value. Right? What did Jesus say about his second coming? <clears throat> Matthew 24, 29, he says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Then he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. <clears throat> he adds in 2531, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him. Now, each one of those things are detailed prophecies of specific events and specific happenings which will happen, and Jesus has prophesied that they will happen. They will happen at the time, he says, after the tribulation of those days, and they will happen in the sequence in which he said them. After all, if we can't trust Jesus' prophecy, who can we trust? But this is Paul speaking about the second coming, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul is now the possessor of the mystery that had not been revealed in the Old Testament. Paul tells us this, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now, brethren, I heard a preacher recently who states that Paul here is just repeating Jesus' words in Matthew 24. I mean, seriously? 
If these two accounts were being presented as evidence in a court of law, in support of a single case, the case will be thrown out in an instant. There's not enough supporting evidence. They are two plainly different events being prophesied. There are no common deeds. There's only one common factor across the two chapters, and that's Jesus. Everything else is different. Nearly all of the erroneous teaching on the second coming, presently flooding YouTube and other media, and some of which was recently preached here in this church, carrying the expectation of apocalyptic events before the second coming of Jesus Christ for the church, is based on a failure to discern the difference between this prophecy and this prophecy, between Matthew 24 and 1 Thessalonians 4. And much of this false teaching, sadly, is being peddled by people who claim to be premillennialists, who do not discern the difference. The prophecies are both valid. They will both come true, exactly as prophesied. But they are prophecies of an entirely different event in two entirely different time periods. There will be apocalyptic events before the coming of the Lord to set up his kingdom, but there will be no apocalyptic events before the coming of the Lord to take his church to heaven. It will happen when no one expects it and instantly and immediately, as Paul tells us on 1 Thessalonians 4. So we must now consider the concept of prophecy and its fulfillment. Prophecy in the scriptures is not given as a page filler. You know, it's a bit weak here, padded out with some prophecy. I can't imagine anyone even thinking that, but... It has a real-world purpose. Again, if we return to my favourite man whose name we don't know, the prophet in 1 Kings 13, the man who came and delivered the bad news to Jeroboam at his altar, the prophecy concerning Jeroboam's altar was a rebuke from God concerning the king's departure from the worship of Jehovah to the worship of other gods. And the altar was a visible symbol of the break being made with Solomon's temple in Jerusalem and Jeroboam's new religion, being set up in Samaria. The north had broken away from the south and he was afraid the people would go back to Jerusalem to worship and so he built a new altar and started a new religion. He even instituted a new first day of the year. If you go back and look at that story, it's very, very interesting. What's the first day of Israel's year? What's Israel's New Year's Day? 40th day of Nisan, Passover. He instituted the feast on the 15th day. See, it's close. Yeah, see, if you're not careful, you'll miss it. But there it is. So he changed the order of things. And the altar was the visible symbol of that change. God's rebuke was directed specifically at the altar as the focus of his anger. When the prophet comes, the prophet's prophecy says, Oh, altar, altar, thus says the Lord. The prophet is speaking to the altar. Now he's talking to the people round about, and he's talking to Jeroboam, who's present there. But God's rebuke is direct at this altar, this piece of metal that's there. And the punishment was directed at the altar also. The prophet says, this altar is going to split open. And all the ashes are going to fall from the grate at the top down to the ground and be spilled out on the ground. So God is going to smite this altar as a symbol of him smiting Jeroboam's pagan religion. No sooner had he said so, that had happened. God was in picture smiting the idolatry of the north in his anger against their departing from the true worship of God in the south. And also the long-term prophecy, and of course that happened, the long-term prophecy was that the a man called Josiah, a king from the south, would burn the bones of Jeroboam's priests on that actual altar. And that happened 350 years later. So the prophet names the event in detail and names the man who's going to be the instrument of that event 350 years before it happens. That is gobsmacking, isn't it? Even for us who accept biblical prophecy. I mean, that's pretty much up there with an outrageous prophecy. Both these things happen. No sooner the man of God spoke and the altar did split open. 350 years later, the King Josiah did burn the bodies of Jeroboam's priests on that actual altar. 2 Kings 23, 15. Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel and the high place which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, 
who made Israel to sin had made, and he burned the high place and crushed it to powder and burnt the wooden image. And then we read in 16, as Josiah turned, he saw the tombs that were there on the mountain, and he sent and took the bones out of the tomb and burned them on the altar and defiled it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed, who had proclaimed these words. Josiah deliberately fulfilled a 350-year-ago prophecy by burning the bones of those actual prophets of Jeroboam on Jeroboam's actual altar. Now that's prophecy. That's saying something's going to happen, and either by the hand of God or by the hand of man or a mixture of both, those things coming to pass exactly as they are prophesied to come to pass. So both the short-term prophecy came to pass and therefore must be considered to have been fulfilled. We must not, not look for the event to have any deeper spiritual significance, nor as yet an unfulfilled dimension. It's done. Which brings us to this. Which Old Testament prophecies then have been fulfilled? Which have yet to be fulfilled? And are there any that have been partially fulfilled? How long have you got? <laughs> and again, going back to internet research, because I tend to do a lot of that. Wonderful. The internet's a wonderful thing. You don't have to spend a fortune on good theological books anymore. Now, mind you, some of the stuff on the internet is rubbish. You know that, and I know that. Be discerning when you're reading the internet. Be discerning when you're watching videos and stuff. Just because someone puts it up there and he's got a collar on back to front and three degrees after his name from a theological seminary doesn't mean he knows what he's talking about. So be discerning. <clears throat> but if you go on the internet and ask what about fulfilled prophecy, well, the answer is a pineapple. One premillennialist yet to be fulfilled prophecy is an amillennialist. It's all done and dusted and finished with prophecy. For the amillennialist and the kingdomist, come let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion the law shall go forth and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. That's happening right now in churches across Australia today, this morning. It's being taught, if they bother to go back to the Old Testament at all, because most of them are too lazy to do it. It's being taught that Micah 4 2 is being fulfilled right now in the church. The nations are flowing up to the spiritual Zion, and the word of the Lord is going out from the spiritual Zion, and the nations are being blessed because of it. In the answer to the question, then, dependent upon your decided views of prophetical scripture, does the answer some people say it's been fulfilled, some people it hasn't. Does that just depend on your preconceived template upon which you read prophecy? Some people say that. The gospel writers themselves noted that prophecy was being fulfilled in Jesus' day. Time and time again as you read the New Testament again. If you're in the habit of, if you've got a physical Bible anymore, I guess, if you're in the habit of marking a Bible and reading through the gospels, every time it pops up, put a little mark there where it says, and this he did that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Mm. This he did that the scriptures might. It's there all the time. I was just going to say, Paul, it's very interesting the way you're bringing it forth, how the Lord, after he rose, the items are revealed in the correct sections of time. How the Lord, when he rose, spoke to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus and said, don't you understand that the scriptures have fulfilled that the Saviour should suffer and die? Absolutely. So in that section, the time he revealed, he revealed. Absolutely. And you know, the Gospels are written after the time of Jesus, looking back at it. And the people who write the Gospels are saying, this he did that it might be fulfilled. Okay, When, when Palm Sunday happens and Jesus rides into Jerusalem on the cult of the fall of an ass, everyone goes, oh, that's an Old Testament prophecy. And the Gospel writers say... He did this and fulfilled an Old Testament prophecy. They're saying that when they write about him after he's died, risen again and ascended to heaven, perhaps 20, 30, 40, 50 years after it's happened, but even when Jesus was here, people noted that prophecy was being fulfilled. Okay? We read when Jesus cast the money changers out of the temple, the disciples remembered at the time that the scriptures said, the zeal of your house has eaten me up. Psalm 69, 9. 
as Jesus is throwing these wicked men out of the temple, the disciples are cross-referencing it back to Psalms and saying, that's what the Psalms said. We're watching prophecy being fulfilled right here before our eyes. That's what it's meant in Psalm 69.9. So they didn't just start doing that after Pentecost. They were doing it at the time. There are too many and numerous examples for us to ignore of that. The apostles after Pentecost and into the writings of the epistles continued this observation connection template. But I want you to notice one important fact. Not once did the gospel writers or the apostles take an Old Testament prophecy and give it a spiritual interpretation. Not once. Every single time they looked at an Old Testament prophecy, they looked to a real world, a real world literal fulfillment in the life and the words of Jesus or at some time after that. We must not look at Old Testament prophecy, especially those about Israel and the kingdom, and spiritualize them and turn them into prophecies about the church age, which was not then being revealed. It's absurd to say that Jesus is being revealed in the Old Testament before he's revealed at Pentecost. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. I would urge you to read the prophetical scriptures and the Old Testament, especially in the light of the mystery doctrine. I think you'll find that they make a lot more sense when you see the target audience and the singular subject. I'd urge you the same approach when reading the teachings of Jesus. Read the Beatitudes, for example, and ask yourself if they are church age teaching or law based moral teaching. Jesus' answer to the question, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel in Acts 1 6 was not, no, there's not going to be a kingdom. Now I'm sure that if some of our scholars were able to go back to Acts chapter 1, they would have Jesus saying, no, there's not going to be a kingdom, you silly people. You misunderstood all those Old Testament prophecies. It's all about the church. He didn't say that. And he didn't say, yes, there will be a kingdom, but not an earthly one. But he did say that there will be a, a postponement of the kingdom as expected while another program took place. While another program took place. It's not for you to know the times and the seasons, he says, that the Father has put in his hands. But you shall receive power after you've come, after the Spirit of God has come upon you. You'll be witness to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Stop thinking about that. I've got a new plan. You're going to be part of that. And that's fairly clear from the context of what's being said there. The gap between Acts 1 6 and now is 2,000 plus years. And until the plan of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ to the nations is completed to God's satisfaction and all of those who are going to be saved are called in, the kingdom can't and won't come. When God calls time on the mystery program, then the kingdom program will immediately recommence. It's vital for good interpretation for us to understand that if the church program was a secret only revealed at Pentecost, then the passage of the last 2,000 years of human history and of the church's history is and was likewise still a secret. Can't have one without the other. This wholly explains the seeming lack of continuity in Daniel's prophecy in the 70 weeks. Now, people mess up the 70 weeks prophecy because there's a gap in the middle and the prophet doesn't say it. All right? He says, the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And then the very next verse, it says, and he will establish a covenant with many. Who? Well, the kingdom people say, well, that's talking about Jesus. But then it says the covenant is to destroy the temple and to bring a wave of abominations. Well, it can't be Jesus, can it? So in between that verse and that verse, there's 2,000 years so far. And God didn't reveal it to Daniel because it was a mystery. and It wasn't going to be revealed till after Pentecost. And we need to read our scriptures in the Old Testament, especially about that. Daniel's prophecy only makes sense if you read it that there's a gap in between those two verses and we're in that gap. Bearing in mind this, we need to come back to some things that we brought up and didn't resolve, didn't we? We find that three prophets in six separate references identify David as the future king of Israel. Long after David's death, how can this be? Well, it's easy and lazy to say, it's too hard to figure that out. Let's just spiritualize the prophecies and make it all about Jesus, right? 
But we shouldn't really do that if the prophecies don't let us do that, and the prophecies don't let us do that. Here's the references. I've already read one of them out. We'll get back to it, remember? This is Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 8 and 9. It shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from your neck. Break who? The Antichrist, surely. I will break his yoke from your neck and burst your bonds. Foreigners shall no more enslave them. What did Jesus, what did the prophet say in 2 Samuel 7? The people will be settled in the land and move no more. Neither shall the sons of wickedness oppress them anymore as they are doing. And now this prophecy says, Foreigners shall no more enslave them, but they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, who I will raise up for them. I want to tell you, when I first read these passages when I was a very young man, they leapt off the page of me like someone was hitting between the eyes with a baseball bat. How can that be? And then I found more. I thought this one might be a mistake. There, must, there, there couldn't be others. Oh, yes, there is. Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 32, 23 and 24. Therefore I will save my flock. They shall no longer be a prey, and I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will establish one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them. My servant David. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David, a prince among them, I, the Lord, have spoken. And once again, I'm not making this up. You can, I give you all these references. You go back and look at You can look them in the context of the passage. This is there in the scriptures. We've, they've always been there. They've been there for a couple of thousand years. Ezekiel 37, 24 and 25. They shall no longer defile themselves anymore with their gods or with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned, and I will cleanse them. They shall be my people, and I will be their God. David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. Then they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant, where your fathers dwelt. And they shall dwell there, they, their children, and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. It's getting to be a pretty consistent picture, isn't it? And Hosea 3, 5, Afterward the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter day. Now, I can give you these references I urge you to go back and read the context of these chapters, not just these verses. Don't read them just in isolation. Read the context of what is there and the prophecies. But even in their standalone iteration, they're pretty amazing, aren't they? Mm. <clears throat> after the restoration of the nation, after being established in the land forever, after they are cleansed from idolatry and iniquity, and after the sons of wickedness can oppress them no more, as before times, after all these things, God says he will raise up David as a prince and a king to rule over the house of Israel forever. How can this be? On the basis of what we set as a standard millennial scheme of things, when can or will this happen? It cannot be now in the church age, because although the nation of Israel certainly exists in the land at the moment, it is a nation in unbelief and not fulfilling any prophecy, so it can't be now. And indeed, the nation is not yet settled in the land permanently because during the tribulation it will be chased off the land. So it can't be now. It can't be in the years of the Great Tribulation because one of the key features of those years is that Israel will not be permanently settled in the land but will in fact be one more time driven off the land and have to be regathered to the land one more time. This will be by persecution and voluntarily for people's own self-preservation. Israel will not be cleansed of its iniquity in those years, but many will come to the gospel of the kingdom and become believers in Jesus Christ. Incidentally, a verse popped into my head as I was reading this over just yesterday where people asked the question, oh yes, but what about, doesn't salvation stop at the rapture? What does the Bible say? The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In the Old Testament, People called upon the name of the Lord and they were saved. In our age, people call upon the name of the Lord and are saved. In the ages to come, people will call upon the name of the Lord and they will be saved. Now, it can't be after the millennium either, because then there'll be a new heavens and a new earth. 
Jesus himself will be king of kings and lord of lords. No racial divisions will exist then in the new world. We'll be all one in Christ Jesus. So there's only one time the prophecy of a resurrected David as king over his nation, the physical nation, is during the millennium itself. And both these verses themselves and the context of all of these verses make it clear that this will be the case. In a way which the verses do not explain and nowhere else in the scripture explains, David, the literal David, resurrected, will be, as with the Old Testament saints, a figure prominent in the religious and political hierarchy of the nation of Israel during the time of Jesus' reign here on earth, between the tribulation and the new heavens and the new earth. Now, this should present no theological problem, brethren. If we believe that Jesus died and then rose from the dead to continue his mission, it should not be difficult for us to believe that God will raise David from the dead and continue his mission. That should not be difficult. That's nice and neat, isn't it? Case closed, Governor. All right, we can all go home now. Well, not really. What about the descendant of David? Promised in 2 Samuel 7. See, I told you I was going to say it. You got me. I told you I was going to say it. 2 Samuel 7, verse 12. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your father, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father. He shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took from Saul, who I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. Now, we've looked at this passage before. This can't be Jesus, can it? All the factors line up except there's one piece of the jigsaw that you can't hammer in place. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him. Further, it can't be David. Because David, at the start of the millennium, will have been resurrected with all the Old Testament saints and be enjoying a permanent life a new life in the millennium as perfected saints. And furthermore that, he can't be both the starter of the prophecy and the fulfilment of the prophecy. You can't be your own descendant, if you want to put it that way. So we have to think about who will go into the millennium and in what spiritual state to deduce, if we can, the identity of the man who figures so prominently in 2 Samuel 7 and in Ezekiel 46. Could this be the sun in verse 12 of Revelation? So, who will be in the millennium? Who wants to vote? The church will be in the millennium. We will be in the millennium. All the Old Testament believers will be in the millennium. The martyred saints of the tribulation will be in the millennium. Israel, born again at seeing Jesus coming to earth, according to that passage, we've just read them, will repent and be born into the family of God will be in the millennium. All these will be perfect in Christ and incapable ever again of sin. So who's left? Who's left? Only two groups of humanity remain to be accounted for. The living tribulation saints and the nations. The vast number of unbelievers who have not come from Israel, but come from the nations round about. And since the son of David prophesied will be one who could possibly be capable of sin, we must conclude that he will come from among the living tribulation saints and will be selected by God to be bestowed with great honour as prophesied. It says in the prophecy in 2 Samuel 7, he will build a house for God's name. Now I'm going to be real mean <coughs> here. And I'm going to give you a Bible quiz. God's only ever had two houses. Which ones were they? What are they? The temple and the tabernacle. Okay, who built the tabernacle? Moses. More specifically? The Jews. The Jews. More specifically? Aaron. The temple was built by a man called Bezalel, the son of Uri, who came not from the tribe of Levi, but from the tribe of Judah. 
Moses was given the blueprint. The Levites and the priests administered the tabernacle, but the building and everything about the building was built by a man called Bezalel, the son of Uri, from the tribe of Judah, not from the priestly tribe. All right, who built the temple? Solomon. What tribe did he come from? He comes from the tribe of Judah. So God's two earthly houses of worship were both built not by the Levites or the priests, but by a man from the tribe of Judah. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because it, it places a context on what we have here. The man in 2 Samuel 7 is said, he will build a house for the Lord. Will this man be the architect and builder of the millennial temple as Bezalel was the builder of the tabernacle and Solomon was the builder of the temple in Jerusalem. Is that a reasonable conclusion? It's certainly a reasonable question to ask. God will call him his son, and if, only if, he commits <coughs> sin, God will punish him, but specifically, he says, he will not remove his mercy from him as he did from Saul. The prophecy does not envisage this man committing sin, the words are a clue to his mortal state. He will be a person who is capable of committing sin. So he's not a perfected saint. He has to be a mortal man. Now I believe this man is the man who's known as the prince. In the passage that David read for us. 17 times. 17 times, brethren. In the last eight chapters of Ezekiel, we read of the prince and all the fine little details that concern the prince. Now, those details in all of themselves are not necessarily important, but they are different from anything else than the tabernacle and Solomon's temple and the church. The prince has a gate set aside just for him. He comes in and he leaves by that gate. The people come in through the north gate, they have to go out through the south gate. Or if they come in through the south gate, they have to go out through the north gate. The prince has a gate which is his gate. He enters via that gate and he <laughs> leaves by that gate. There's a different set of rules for him than there is for the rest of the people. What's special about this man? This man is David's co-regent during the time of the room of the millennium. He is a detailed participant in its building and in its services, just as Exodus 25 to 31 described in great detail the plan and then the building of the tabernacle. So the last eight chapters of Ezekiel show us the plan and the building and the hierarchy of the millennial temple. <coughs> now, I challenge anyone to spiritualize these chapters and make them a picture of the church. Mental gymnastics required to do so would be absolutely extraordinary. It's also mind-blowing if you take the genealogical necessity into consideration yep. for this to be uh, not spiritualized, but actual yeah. prophecy, as you say. Well, how do you spiritualize those 19 verses in Ezekiel? How do you take each one of those little details and say, that means something in the church age? It's, it, it just can't be done. It's not workable. It's not a workable thesis. Now, I have in the past identified this man, the prince, as being Zerubbabel. But obviously he can't be because as the builder of the Restoration Temple in the post-exilic years, he too will have been resurrected in the rapture. He too will be a perfect person living in the millennium. It has to be someone who is born during the tribulation and lives on into the millennium and has a part in the worship of the nations during the millennium. This man will have a part in what Micah is talking about. The nations will flow up to Jerusalem and come and say, let us go to Zion and worship the Lord. And this man will have a part of that. Now the spiritualizers would instantly say, well, that just means the whole slabs of the Old Testament are not for us Christians, given that you're saying that they are about and to the children of Israel. My answer to that is, yes, you're right about the last bit. They are to and about the children of Israel. To the rest, I must say that we read and accept the Old Testament as being the word of God in all its books and passages. Why not allow these passages too, for example, to be about them too? 
I find it difficult to reconcile that people on the one hand who can turn everything in the Old Testament into a spiritual picture of the church can also lack the spiritual discernment to see that these prophecies cannot be about the church. Why would God spend eight chapters of Ezekiel, 600 years before Pentecost, describing the church to people for whom it has no relevance? Now, there's heaps more that we can see to dive into the streams of prophecy that the Bible affords us. And I can say that quite honestly because the next three messages I preach are going to be what about the rapture, what about the tribulation, what about the millennium? So we're not done yet now. <laughs> what can I say in conclusion just of these two things? Two things, I feel. Prophecy must be read in observation of what the rest of the scripture shows us about the nature and character of God. God does not have one set of character for the Jews, one set of character for the nations, one set of character for the church. He is the same God overall. And again, as we considered last time, if the word makes sense, seek no other sense. Don't go looking for the words of Scripture to be saying something other than what they are clearly saying. God is not the God of riddles and semantic puzzles. He speaks clearly and wants us to understand. Anyone who reads prophecy and claims not to understand it is either willingly ignorant or is trying to use a kitchen fork to dig the Suez Canal. Both are silly exercises. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that by your Spirit you give us understanding of your word. Uh, the Lord Jesus told us that when the Spirit of truth was come, he would lead us into all truth. We ask you increasingly and continually, Lord, to lead us into all truth. Do not let us be trapped into the wording of men in passages of Scripture which clearly say something when they want to make it say something else. Help us, Lord, to be a people who let the Word of God speak for itself and by your Spirit come to an understanding of what you are saying to the people to whom it's addressed and to those of us who read it. Bless us, Lord, and help us to be good students of your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.